Thank you, Gabrielle and Ashley and Ted, for that incredible number. I waited for the Lord. A lot of our lives, we kind of wait for the Lord, don't we? And here again, we wait on the Lord to hear a word from the Lord. These last numbers of weeks, we've been spending our time in the Gospel of St. John. Today, we're going to dip down into the book of Psalms. And so I want to talk a little bit about the book of Psalms before we read our passage from Psalm 34. The Psalms are the Bible's songbook. I don't know if you knew that, but instead of a hymn book, it was the psalm book that became their hymns. In fact, Christians over the centuries, if they wanted to learn how to pray, they picked up the psalms, they read them, they sung them. And today, very simply, I want you to learn to pray. I want you to learn to pray more often, more simply, more honestly. I want you to learn to pray. And there are three things I want you to keep in mind. Keep it short. Keep it honest. Keep it going. Keep it short. Keep it honest. Keep it going. Say them with me. Keep it short. Keep it honest. Keep it going. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But the Psalms will show us how to do all three of those things. To keep it short, keep it honest, and to keep it going. They give us a language for talking to the God who speaks to us all the time. And so we need to know and learn how to respond to this God. Eugene Peterson says that when we're faced with talking with a holy God, most of us have a hard time, and you've got to admit it. Most of us don't feel very comfortable praying. We don't know how to do it. We don't know what words to put together. We feel awkward, out of place. We say, well, I'm not good enough for this. Let me clean up my act a little bit. Then, then I'll pray. Or we say, well, give me a few months or years and let me practice some better language so that I know how to come into God's temple courts. I won't be so stuttery and ill at ease. But when the members of Peterson's church said such things, he put the Psalms in their hand. He said, go and read these and you'll discover that the language of the Psalms is not so eloquent or difficult to master. We think sometimes that praying is what good people do when they're doing their best. No, it's not. We presume on the inexperienced that there's this insider language that you've got to use to address God. There is no insider language. Prayer is elemental. It's not advanced. In fact, help is probably our first prayer. I'm reminded of the time when our son was about two years old. He was a climber. Any of you have climbers when they were little shavers? He would climb on anything. And we had this little plant stand that was right in front of the window. It was little steps, you know. You put African violets on it or whatever. And, and he ended up climbing up the stair steps of that plant stand and stood on the windowsill, which was about this big. And I heard his plaintive cry, someone come help the boy! Someone come help the boy! You know? <laughs> Isn't that our first prayer? <laughs> come help me! And it works. It's a prayer, my friends. That's what it is to keep it simple. Help is most likely our earliest and simplest prayer. You see, prayer is meant to be honest and true and personal. It's the way we get everything in our lives out in the open before God. In our modern translations, that's the problem with our modern translations of the Bible and the Psalms in particular. They sound so beautiful. They sound so Elizabethan, don't they? And you go, well, I can never pray like that. But that's the problem because in the original Hebrew, they were not like that. They were street language. This was marketplace language that people used to address God. They are full of raw honesty. They're earthy and rough. They're not genteel. And they've been part and parcel of the Christian church forever. In fact, in medieval times, that's the only part of the scripture that the Christian church would have known and probably the only part of the scripture that Christians would own was the Psalter, the 150 Psalms. When you read through the Psalms, you'll discover that everything is brought before God. Every conceivable situation, spiritual, emotional, social, and they show us what the dangers of the world are. They show us what we've got to keep in mind all the time, what our attitude should be, how to talk to God, how to ask God for what we need. 
Timothy Keller goes on to say that the Psalms are like a medicine chest for the soul and the heart. In many ways, the Psalms are different than any other part of the Scripture because the Psalms are written to be prayed, to be recited, to be sung. The Psalms are to be done. You do something when you read the Psalms. We are, in a sense, to put the Psalms inside our prayers or to put our prayers inside the Psalms. And we approach God in that way. It's a marvelous thing. If you need to know how to pray, open the Psalms, especially in a modern pan, uh, paraphrase. In doing this, we gain new attitudes. We gain new commitments and promises, even develop new emotions. Reading and praying the Psalms change us in our relationship. We learn how to commit, how to depend on God, how to seek comfort from God, how to lament. We think we can't lament, but we find mercy when we go to confession and repentance and we gain new wisdom. And the Psalms help us to see God the way God really is. You know, left to ourselves, we end up with the God of our own understanding. And we, we end up singing songs like, Drop, kick me Jesus through the goalposts of life. And we think Jesus is just our best buddy. But you read the scripture and you learn differently that God is more holy and wise and fearsome and tender and loving than we could begin to imagine. Read the Psalms. Oh God, when I consider your handiwork, the sun and the stars and the moon which thou hast created, the whole universe, what is man? What are mortals that you consider us? It's then that we learn to place our hand over our mouth in silence before the awesome reality of our mighty and sovereign God. Most of the Psalms read in the light of the rest of salvation history bring us to Jesus because they tell the story of salvation and they're Jesus' songbook. Did you know that? If Jesus wanted to sing, he would open up the Psalms. But now a couple of other things before we read our text. Unbeknownst to us who read it in English, in the original Hebrew, this psalm, Psalm 34, was an alphabetic acrostic. Acrostic means that the first letter of every line was one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, from Aleph to Tov. They're the first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So from A to Z, it's all covered in this poem. Now, we know that no one single poem or psalm can encompass all of God. But by the psalmist choosing each of those letters as one line in the, in the psalm, they're sort of symbolically saying all of language is included in our praise of God. Then there's another thing to notice. This line from the psalm, I think it's verse 9. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Taste and see. Do you, do you see what the psalmist is saying? Try it. Put it in your mouth. Try it in your life. Experience it. Here we're invited to try God's goodness for ourselves and to experience it like we would taste a new food. You know, you, you go to a restaurant and they, they put this marvelous something in front of you and it's like, <gasps> I love food. I really do. Some people eat to live, I live to eat. <laughs> and I never met a carb I didn't love. It's terrible. <laughs> Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take delight, who find, who are blessed, who take refuge in the Lord. Taste and see, my friends. And there's an invitation before us today to taste and see the Lord's goodness in a new way. Because this is the way the living word comes to us, that there's something new for you to hear today. It's dessert. I love dessert. Psalm 34, verses 1 to 10, reading in Jesus' name. The psalmist says this, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. I sought the Lord and He answered me and delivered me from all my fears. 
And those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in prayer? Lord our God, will you help us today in a new way to taste and see your goodness, to learn what it is to pray, to lay our lives out before you. To that end, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember those three things about prayer? Keep it short. Keep it honest. Keep it going. We're going to talk about that. Keep it short. You know, I think sometimes we think it's the sheer number of words that we accumulate that gets an entrance with God. We don't need it to be long and wordy and religious sounding. Keep it short. Just, you know, help. Thanks shucks, or some other word. Please, thank you, God. They're prayers. They're little breath prayers. They're prayed at the stop sign when you're waiting. They're prayed in traffic. They're prayed when you're going to bed, when you're waking up in the morning. Keep it short, but let it be many of them all day long. You don't need to always get down on your knees. You don't need to say the certain entrance word. You know, or say, in Jesus' name. You can just say, God, I need your help today. Keep it short and keep it honest. Do we think, really, that we can keep our thoughts from God to try and hide our true feelings? Do you think we're fooling God when we hide, try and hide our frustrations, our disappointment, our anger, our sheer disgust? There's no way. God knows it all and he wants to hear it all. I served a church in Brentwood, California, and there were some people that that were in the entertainment industry, actors and actresses and screenwriters and such, and, and they wanted to try and figure out what it was to be a Christian working in that kind of industry. And so we had a Bible study for them in our home. And I'll have to tell you, these were people that didn't know very much about the Christian language. And when we first started and, and would gather in a circle and hold hands and pray, I had never heard four-letter words in prayer before. <laughs> and you know what pleased me? They were speaking to God in the only language they knew. And I think God was delighted that these people were pouring out their heart to God. They were being honest with their feelings, with their agony of soul, with their struggles, with their praise of God. And we don't need religious sounding language. We've got to keep it honest. I love the prayer I heard a long time ago. It goes like this, dear Lord, so far I've done all right. I haven't gossiped or lost my temper. I haven't been greedy or grumpy, nasty, selfish, or overindulgent, and I'm really glad about that. But in a few minutes, God, I'm going to get out of bed. (laughs) And then I'm really going to need your help. Now, isn't that an honest prayer? I've done pretty good, you know. But we know the minute our feet hit the floor and we see another person, encounter another human being, face different challenges or temptations, we are going to need help. And so we ask God for help. We keep it short, we keep it honest, and we're going to keep it going. To tell you the truth, the first line from that psalm when I first read it just thwarted me. I go, how can I bless the Lord at all times? How can his praise be continually be in my mouth? I thought, yeah, right. And then I read an article this week that pointed out something I'd never thought of before. Something absolutely incredible that we find in the Bible. And it has something to do with our breath and God's name. 
And I thought of the time, it wasn't long ago that I was in the hospital with a, I had coronary bypass surgery. It really surprised me. But they sent me home with one of these. Some of you recognize that, don't you? It was really painful to do to begin with, wasn't it? And what you're to do is it teaches you to really ventilate your lungs. Without it, you're going to get pneumonia. You can die of pneumonia if you're not ventilating deeply. And it goes like this. <laughs> yeah, that just means I have a lot of hot air. <laughs> I've, I'm well practiced in that, as some of you know. But you know what I learned? I learned that in a new way to cherish my breath, to know how vitally important it is to breathe deeply, to know what happens. My wife, when I got home, she's got a pulse oximeter, she's a nurse. And you learn to breathe that deeply, and your oxygen level goes up in your bloodstream. You know that. And it spells good health for you. And so I learned to cherish my breathing. And here's the fascinating thing that has to do with the name of God. Do you remember that scene before the, the burning bush when God is calling Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? And Moses is freaked out by that possibility. And he says, so when I go to these people, what, who shall I tell them? What's your name? And God gives him his name. It's four letters. They're consonants. There are no vowels in it originally. W or Y-H-W-H. Y-H-W-H. Over time, we've added vowel pointings, A and E, to get Yahweh. Yahweh. Sandra Thurman Kapoor tells us that scholars and rabbis have noticed that the letters Y-H-W-H Listen to this. They represent breathing sounds or aspirated consonants. When pronounced without the intervening vowels, it actually sounds like breathing. Listen to this. I want you to try something with me. Let me explain it. I want you to put your fingers in your ear and breathe deeply three times and listen to your breath. Just do it with me. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? You're speaking God's name. You're speaking God's name. A baby's first breath, a baby's first cry, a deep sigh of sorrow and grief. A groan or a grasp, a gas that's too heavy for words. We're speaking God's name. Even an atheist without knowing it is acknowledging God's name. And likewise, when a person leaves this earth, it's because their breath has left their body. So when I can't utter anything else, is my cry calling out God's name? Absolutely. Being alive means I speak God's name constantly. I wonder if it's heard the loudest when I'm the quietest. In sadness, when we breathe heavily. In joy, when our lungs are almost ready to burst. In fear, when we hold our breath and have to be reminded to breathe deeply, to crank up our courage. When we do something hard, we take a deep breath. When I think about it, breathing is giving God praise, even in the hardest moments. Sandra Capote writes this, think about it. 
God chose to give Himself a name that we can't help but speak every moment we're alive. All of us. Always. Everywhere. Waking, sleeping, breathing the name of God on our lips. You think you don't know how to pray? We do. From our first breath until our last, we speak God's name. So listen to this. When the psalmist says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth and in my lungs. So it is that my soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. And then this, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. Oh, taste. Oh, taste, my friends, and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in Him. Keep it simple. Keep it short. Keep it honest. Keep it going. Will you join me in prayer? Dear God, will you give us the presence of mind that every breath we take that we're praying to remember that and to pray to articulate it in the only way we know how and the only language that we possess to speak your name in praise and in petition and in intercession to lift up all our lives the good, the bad, the ugly before you that our lives might be devoted to you and that we would taste and see that you are good in Jesus' name we pray Amen.